Sound check, sound check. Hi folks, uh, Professor Gulliford here. I'm going to do a screen share and share sound and video and then go over a presentation on mechanical ventilation for hospitalists and hospital-based providers. You should be seeing my screen now. Uh, I am the Respiratory Care Program Director at Autry Tech. This is uh, year 16 uh, in office. We've graduated 135 respiratory therapists, I'm proud to say, uh, and uh, very uh, proud of our program. Your support at St. Mary's is what got the program started 16 years ago. Uh, Professor Jim Grants is our Director of Clinical Education, and he also worked with me on this project. He is the actual instructor for mechanical ventilation at the uh, Tech Center. Much of the information uh, provided here is from the Society of Hospital Medicine. They have three courses in mechanical ventilation for hospitalists, the basics, beyond the basics, and ARDS. I took all three of those courses. I thought that was the best way to understand what a hospitalist uh, needs to know about mechanical ventilation. So I took those three courses. Normally, they're $200, uh, but right now they're free. Uh, that is because of COVID and the the need to get more people uh, skilled on mechanical ventilation. So I love it that any licensed healthcare professional can take those courses free. I really enjoyed it. I learned some things myself, and I encourage you to do that. There's the website. Um, these are the critical values for determining the need for mechanical ventilation, and we prepared for you a laminated card with these numbers um, included. Um, Maximum inspiratory pressure, you may have known that as NIF, negative inspiratory force, but today it is MIP, maximal inspiratory pressure. Uh, minus 20 to zero, that means we want at least a minus 20, better, minus 25, better, 30, uh, for the patient to be able to breathe effectively on their own. If they're not generating at least 20, uh, maybe they're generating 15, then that indicates the need for ventilation. The MEP. Uh, 40 is the crucial number. We want them to generate more than 40, and that will tell us effective cough. If their MEP, their maximal expiratory pressure, is less than 40, they may need to be mechanically ventilated. If the tidal volume is less than 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram ideal body weight, consider ventilation. Tidal volume less than 5 milliliters per kilogram. Respiratory rate greater than 35. Forced expiratory volume in one second, less than 10. Uh, peak expiratory flow rate, uh, less than 75 to 100. And a pH, less than 7.25. Now, please understand, you might not intubate that patient. You might non-invasively ventilate them to get that pH into a better position. Uh, but the 7.25 is the critical number telling you to consider ventilation. PaCO2 greater than 55 and rising. Please understand if the patient is COPD and they always have a CO2 of 60, then we sure won't uh, ventilate them at 55. Um, and then the PaO2 less than 70 on 60% oxygen. Uh, that 60% oxygen is a crucial number. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio less than 200. Patient might need to be ventilated. That's all on a card for you. Um, I know that slide was a little hard to see, but the uh, the card is clear. Goals of mechanical ventilation, oxygenate, ventilate, meet the patient's physiologic demand, minimize comfort, and minimize injury. Those are certainly the priorities as we uh, ventilate patients. We've found better ways to ventilate patients over uh, recent years. I'm excited about that. We'll share some of those better ways. VQ matching, you recall from your physiology uh, course, Lung ventilation and perfusion must match for effective ventilation and oxygenation to occur. VQ mismatching comes with physiologic shunt, like alveolar injury, destruction, collapse, anatomic shunt or intrapulmonary shunt, though there will always be some of that. Uh, we think that everyone has at least 5% shunt. Um, and just That's the nature of the, uh, the circulation system. Uh, inadequate, obstructed, or dysregulated lung perfusion, let's say pulmonary embolism as an example, and then ventilator mismanagement. Um, one of the big things we've learned is that we were using tidal volumes considerably too large throughout my career until just, I'd say, the last five years, uh, we were using tidal volumes too large and causing uh, mismanagement. Here is the Goldilocks principle. Uh, 
one side too firm, one side too soft, in the middle just right. It's the Goldilocks and the Three Bears analogy. In uh, dead space, you have ventilation and excessive perfusion. In shunts, you have perfusion and excessive ventilation. And then there is the beautiful, uh, perfectly matched, or nearly perfectly matched, uh, in between, the Goldilocks principle. Oxygenation. Oxygen diffuses across pressure and concentration gradients. And there are really just two factors in oxygenation. The FiO2 is the oxygen percentage delivered. We are going to try hard to keep that at 60% or below because we have now learned that FiO2s above 60 are toxic and they are causing damage in the lungs. They are perhaps leading to uh, permanent damage. They're definitely leading to short-term reductions in surfactant production. That's very important. You can actually measure the decline in surfactant production at high FiO2s. Um, PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. These days, we're using more PEEP and less FiO2, and that is a safer way to ventilate the patient. We'll talk about that in some detail. Add PEEP. What is it? PEEP is just raising the patient's baseline. In this example, they have 10 centimeters of water PEEP so that their lungs are always inflated at 10 centimeters of water, and then they are being ventilated above that level. I would say 10 is a pretty common uh, level of PEEP these days. The average at the University of Oklahoma Medical Center, uh, where our students uh, rotate, is 14. They actually conducted a study to see what is the average PEEP in the medical ICU, and it's 14. Ventilation. CO2 excretion must match its production. You've got minute ventilation, which is respiratory rate times tidal volume, and you've got tidal volume, which is alveolar ventilation plus dead space ventilation. Resting minute ventilation is five to six liters per minute. However, many of our patients uh, require 10 or even 15 uh, liters per minute of minute ventilation, and that's because of very poor uh, lung health. A lot of mismatching, for example. Fix ventilation first. This concept goes back to my training days in the 1980s, and it still works. If you have a patient with both problems, meaning low PaO2 and high PaCO2, fix ventilation first. Fix the CO2. Often the oxygen problem is corrected once ventilation is appropriate. There might be no need to increase the FiO2 in these cases, and we would definitely prefer not to raise the FiO2 for the reasons we've already mentioned here. Fix ventilation first. Flow, volume, and pressure. This slide is really for the respiratory therapists uh, because doctors don't have to worry about this. If you will give us tidal volume, FiO2, rate, and PEEP, we will take it from there and do everything else that's necessary. But there's quite a bit that's necessary. Um, let's start with the idea that flow is volume divided by time. Volume is flow divided by time. Pressure is flow times resistance, and then resistance is pressure divided by flow. When we make a change in any of those variables, there will need to be changes in the other variables to keep the patient safely ventilated. For example, let's, uh, let's say that we raise the tidal volume by 100 milliliters. Well, that new tidal volume is going to require a higher peak flow rate, which the respiratory therapist will determine and, and set that. It may have affected the patient's inspiratory to expiratory ratio, so that needs to be evaluated. And it may need a new pressure alarm, a high pressure alarm, because of that larger tidal volume. So one small change can actually produce a lot of other changes that need to be made. Hemodynamics of positive pressure ventilation, decreased venous return to the heart, that does happen, unloading of the left ventricle, and strain on the right ventricle. Uh, so one of the things we watch for in terms of levels of PEEP is has the PEEP affected the patient's hemodynamic status, uh, roughly measured by blood pressure. Uh, if the PEEP has started to reduce the patient's blood pressure, which was probably reduced cardiac output, then we have gone too far with the PEEP and we should back off. By the way, move by two at a time as you adjust PEEP from 10 to 12, 12 to 14, and so on. All right, moving ahead, 
volume control ventilation. Now we'll talk a little bit about the, the different modes of ventilation. By far the most common volume control ventilation, assist control mode, the patient triggers the vent, assisting, we say, the, pay, the vent, and a predetermined flow and tidal volume are delivered. We set the respiratory rate, that's called a control function, and then every breath over the minimum set rate is delivered at fixed flow and tidal volume. The patient does not breathe spontaneously, meaning they don't take their own breaths with assist control ventilation. You control minute volume, uh, minute ventilation, but not maximum minute ventilation. The patient can assist. Let's say you've got it set at a rate of 12 on assist control, but the patient is breathing 18 times. Well, we do not have control of that maximum minute ventilation. Remember, if you control tidal volume, you cannot control pressure. So as you adjust tidal volume, pressure is going to change in volume control ventilation. All right, volume control ventilation, the main settings are FiO2, I already mentioned 60% uh, being our goal, and PEEP. Uh, we generally start at five of PEEP and work up from there. Many patients find their optimum PEEP in the 10 to 15 uh, range. Don't be afraid of PEEP. Uh, I think maybe there has been a historical concern about uh, the adverse effects of PEEP. If we move slowly, um, and watch the patient's blood pressure, there's simply no reason to be afraid of PEEP. In fact, PEEP is much safer than very high levels of FiO2. Respiratory rate is how we usually determine ventilation and tidal volume uh, also can be used to determine ventilation. If we have set the tidal volume correctly to begin with, then we will usually be adjusting rate to adjust ventilation. PEEP. There it is. Don't be afraid of PEEP. It's safer than very high levels of oxygen. PEEP should start at five. It's not considered therapeutic until it reaches eight. Almost any patient will tolerate eight of PEEP without adverse hemodynamic uh, effects. PEEP recruits uh, collapsed injured alveoli, uh, keeps at-risk alveoli from collapsing, collapsing, improves lung compliance, and keeps the patient breathing on the compliant portion of the pressure volume curve. So work of breathing goes down when PEEP is set at an optimal level. General rules for increasing or decreasing PEEP. We increase PEEP when the patient still has hypoxemia, atelectasis, mucus plugging, obesity, uh, abdominal distension, left ventricular failure. We decrease PEEP with worsening hypercarbia, hypotension, preload dependent states such as right ventricular failure and hypovolemia. Just going to slide that down so I can see where I'm at. All right, respiratory rate, faster isn't always better. We'd like to keep the IE ratio, that's the ratio of inspiratory time to expiratory time, at about one to three. We can, we can deal with one to two, but sometimes we need a much longer expiratory time. That would be emphysema as an example. So let's shoot for one to three on the inspiratory to expiratory ratio. Usually we adjust that with flow rate. Once respiratory rate is greater than 25, the risk of breath stacking auto peep increases. That is the patient is not able to completely exhale before the next breath is arriving. The patient does not fully exhale before the next breath arrives and we wind up stacking breaths. It's called auto peep. It's uncomfortable. It increases the risk of barotrauma and it worsens dead space. Faster isn't always better. Managing hypercarbia, high PaCO2, increased tidal volume if it's set too low. Um, these days we start generally at eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. There's actually a slide coming up here with all the standard initial settings. But generally we start at eight milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight, not the patient's actual body weight. Um, so increased tidal volume if it's set too low. If whoever started the vent was using a lower number there, then fix that. But then if that is correct, increase respiratory rate, improve VQ matching. Uh, we can also decrease CO2 production in certain ways, sedation, analgesia, uh, paralytics, and pyretics, treatment of sepsis. Sometimes we live with it. Uh, sometimes we decide that a slightly high CO2 is okay. Moderate respiratory acidosis, as long as the pH greater than 7.2, it is perfectly safe. 
And our goal is not a PaCO2 of 40. Our goal is the patient's own normal PaCO2. Putting it all together, initial ventilator settings, we have created a laminated card for you uh, with these initial settings on it. Uh, FiO2, start with the same FiO2 that the patient was on before the ventilator. Uh, let's say EMS has brought us the patient and the patient is on a, a non-rib breather delivering about 90% oxygen. Well, that's a good place to start on the vent. Uh, let's say the patient's on a six liter uh, nasal cannula. Uh, six times four is 24 plus room air uh, takes us up to 45% uh, oxygen. That's a good place to start on the ventilator. Uh, usually we leave this FiO2 the same because the ventilation is going to fix any remaining hypoxemia. Then adjust the FiO2 so that the saturation is 92% or the blood gas PO2 is 60. Those two will correlate. 60 gets you 90. You've probably heard it, remember it from physiology class. Uh, total volume, four to eight, but usually eight. It's unusual uh, to go as low as four. Uh, respiratory rate, 10 to 24, but more typically 10 to 14, and PEEP, five to, uh, five to 10. Honestly, I would not start at 10 of PEEP, but I would go there pretty quickly. I would start at five of PEEP. In hypoxemia, uh, which should you increase, FiO2 or PEEP? Well, the best practice is to raise FiO2 to 60%, and then start adding PEEP instead of going up further on the FiO2. FiO2 levels above 60 are now clearly shown to result in oxygen toxicity. Uh, early years in my career, we routinely used uh, 70, 80, 90% uh, oxygen without realizing that we were causing significant problems for the patient's lungs. Some of those problems don't go away, and we were definitely reducing surfactant production. Which ventilator mode is best? I love this little uh, quote. The best mode is the one which fixes the patient's problems without harming the patient and without confusing the provider. <laughs> if you have heard about some new uh, shiny mode of ventilation, but you haven't had a chance to actually work with it, I wouldn't use that new shiny mode of ventilation. I would either find someone who does have experience uh, using it, uh, or I would uh, choose a different mode with which you are comfortable and familiar. There we go. Sys control, uh, volume control. The pros, you control tidal volume and respiratory rate. Low risk of volume trauma. Volume trauma is stretching of the lungs because of too much volume. And it has the strongest evidence base. We do much more assist control, volume control ventilation than any other mode. The cons, patient controls nothing, sometimes uncomfortable, and there is a risk of barotrauma because pressure is going to vary with whatever we do with that tidal volume. Assist control, pressure control. There's a time to move from volume control to pressure control. Most of us agree that that is a, a, a PIP, a peak inspiratory pressure of 50, which you cannot fix in the usual ways, or a plateau pressure above 30. Uh, when I say the usual ways, those will be bronchodilators, uh, suctioning, maybe taking off some fluid. We go to pressure control ventilation with a PIP over 50 or a plat, plateau pressure over 30. When moving from assist control volume control to assist control pressure control, start at the plateau pressure. Whatever the plateau pressure was on volume control, that will be your setting for pressure control. Respiratory rate should be the same as you make the move. PEEP, the same. FiO2, the same. You cannot set or control volume in this mode. So as the patient's lungs get stiffer, tidal volume goes down. As the patient's lungs get more compliant, tidal volume goes up. And you cannot control that. You can set alarms to let, it, but to let you know it's happening, but you cannot control it. The advantages of assist control, pressure control, the pros and cons. You control pressure and thereby control the risk of barotrauma. That is a good thing. A lot of therapists uh, and pulmonologists feel that pressure control ventilation is actually more physiologic. It's more comfortable for the patient. Uh, lung recruitment happens with increased inspiratory time. The cons, the patient controls nothing other than maximum respiratory rate and tidal volume changes from breath to breath. We have another mode that we're going to discuss, maybe soon here, 
um, which takes care of that changing tidal volume for us. And here it is. It's the very next slide. Volume control ventilation with auto flow. And what is auto flow? It's an algorithm that adjusts ventilation breath by breath to give you a consistent tidal volume. So we get the advantages of pressure control, but we have a guaranteed tidal volume. Auto flow makes that adjustment for you. It's a nice advancement in ventilation. Uh, the people at Draeger who uh, created your ventilators, and by the way, you have great ventilators. Draeger is, is just awesome. Um, they really did the whole industry a favor uh, when they created auto flow. SIMV, I'm definitely the guy to talk about this uh, uh, mode because it's an old mode. Uh, mm -hmm. I can say simply to you in the hospital setting, don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, seldom used today in uh, in acute care, but we do use it for long-term weaning cases, uh, typically in the LTAC uh, setting. The set respiratory rate is all mandatory breaths, but the patient can breathe between those breaths with their own spontaneous breaths. It is helpful to see the volume that the patient is generating between those machine breaths. Uh, it's often used in LTEC settings, not the acute hospital. Let me tell you why it fell into uh, disfavor. SIMV works, but it delays the weaning process. It makes it a longer process to get the patient off the ventilator. And because of that, it's not used in hospitals very much today. APRV, uh, airway pressure release ventilation, not good. Oh, it is good for patients with low lung compliance, like ARDS and covid uh, APRV was very helpful with uh, some of our COVID patients. It's not at all good for obstructive lung disease patients. So just remember APRV, no, not for COPD, not for asthma, nothing with an obstructive component. We set the P high, the high pressure at 15 to 35. The P low is always zero. T high, that's the time that the high pressure is sustained, is at five seconds and T low is at 0 0.5 seconds. Aggressively wean down the FiO2 to hit your target saturation of 92%. You keep hearing that 92% number, and that is another uh, important change in the way we think about ventilation. When I started, my gosh, we would often have um, you know SaO2s in the 95, 96, 97 range. There's no benefit to that. Absolutely nothing is gained, and you're using more oxygen, more FiO2 to get those saturations of 95, 96, 97. So we're happy with 92. To wean from APRV is drop and stretch. Bring down the P high two at a time and prolong the T high one at a time. Eventually, you're going to wind up with CPAP. That's what CPAP is, a continuous pressure at the same level. Uh, you stay on, uh, continue weaning until P high is 18 and T high is more than 10 seconds. That essentially is CPAP. Your patient must be spontaneously breathing and cannot be paralyzed. No, you cannot use neuromuscular blockers and uh, APRV because the patient needs to breathe on their own. I'm going to get a sip of coffee here. My throat is drying out. That will help. ARDS. The Berlin criteria for ARDS are listed right here. I will not read them to you, but we have a very good understanding of what is ARDS and what is not ARDS. Uh, those are the blend uh, criteria. You may refer to those uh, as you're trying to decide, is this in fact ARDS? Bilateral opacities and hypoxemia not fully explained by heart failure. So ARDS is not CHF and it's not pulmonary edema. And the symptom onset within one week of the presumed assault, whatever that might have been. Let's say a, a smoke inhalation, acute lung injury uh, of some kind, uh, that would be the presumed assault. Motor vehicle accident would be another example. So we'll talk a little further about ARDS. That is the ARDS chest x-ray. Uh, look at the beautiful air bronchograms uh, in that chest. It's, they're not beautiful if you're the patient. Um, but we say white out. Um, I've heard snowstorm. Um, bilateral opacities. They are diffuse. They're throughout the lungs. Uh, the, uh, the, the term that's seen on board exams is reticulogranular, reticulogranular appearance. What do we do? The ARDS strategy is lung protective. 
Title volumes are now going to be six instead of eight. Uh, recruit injured and collapsed alveoli. Minimize injury and complications. Maintain comfort, synchrony. Very important to get the patient synchronized with the ventilator. Uh, RTs are, are expert at that. Uh, we use something called uh, trigger sensitivity these days, flow trigger sensitivity. That has really made an important uh, difference. Maintain plateau pressure less than 30. Titrate the PEEP. Do not overventilate. We say permissive hypercapnia. That is, it's okay for the patient's CO2 to be a little high as long as the pH is greater than 7.2. APRV may help these patients. Uh, let the RT help if you decide to uh, go with that mode. ARDS uh, fluid management. It is conservative fluid management, as you I'm sure know. Uh, conservative fluid management results in reduced ventilator days, improved oxygenation, reduced risk of organ injury, use the least amount of fluid needed to maintain hemodynamic integrity and organ perfusion. So many conditions, uh, we, uh, you know, we were, we're intent on hydrating, right? We want to uh, add more fluid, but in these ARDS patients, that is not helpful at all. I flow nasal cannula. You may actually avoid uh, some intubations by using high flow nasal cannula. Airvo, uh, Vapotherm, uh, your facility uses uh, Airvo, which is a very good technology, may reduce intubation rates. It's worth considering if the patient is awake and alert, hemodynamically stable, has one organ failure, not multi uh, system failure, and has only mild hypercapnia. High flow cannula, uh, you know, we can go up to 60 liters per minute now. When I heard that Airvo was going up to 60, I thought that's just too much. The patient won't tolerate it. But as long as the gas is heated to body temperature and fully humidified, the patient does tolerate it. Yeah. Proning. Uh, let's see. The top two images, A and B, are supine, and the bottom two images are prone. You can see, particularly in the posterior lung regions, there is much better ventilation taking place. And that means better oxygenation. The lungs are better expanded. We've got better VQ matching. Proning helps. We already knew that, but we really learned that in, um, in COVID. Uh, so, you know, even a patient doesn't have to be intubated to benefit. They could be on a, a nasal cannula or mask and we simply roll them over, put them in the Superman position as somebody uh, coined that term. And Proning is helpful. In patients with severe ARDS, a PAO2 less, or a PF ratio, PAO2 to FiO2 ratio less than 120. Proning improves oxygenation, reduces mortality. It should be done 12 to 16 hours at a time. Some people misunderstood proning. We would see patients who would be prone for an hour or a, a, just a few hours. That's not how it works. Patients should be prone 12 to 16 hours at a time. Neuromuscular blockers, yes. Uh, risks are pressure injury and line or tube dislodgement. We saw some of that happen. Um, Got to be careful, you know, when you're putting the patient on their belly. Neuromuscular blockade, ARDS ventilator modes are uncomfortable. Dyssynchrony worsens. That should say worsens gas exchange. And I'm pretty sure dyssynchrony is with one S. Um, lower oxygen utilization, lower ventilator demand. That is true. However, neuromuscular blockers do have incidence of ICU-acquired weakness, and we cannot monitor neurological exam pain and anxiety. So, you know, judicious use, I would say, of neuromuscular blockade. What to do about it in ARDS? Do not routinely paralyze patients with ARDS. Consider it in severe ARDS when the patient is unable to oxygenate or ventilate. Dyssynchrony cannot be managed with sedation alone. The patient is being prone. If we paralyze, we must sedate. Uh, the alternative is torture. Putting it together, recognize early ARDS, try to you know, get on top of it. Consider the high-flow nasal cannula early. That might avoid intubation. And then the ventilator strategy is volume control or pressure control, four to six, not eight. Plateau pressure less than 30. Optimize PEEP and sedate to maintain synchrony. If the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, commonly known as the PF ratio, remains less than 150, 
transfer. Uh, we have some excellent tertiary centers here in Oklahoma uh, who deal with this all the time. Prone ventilation, neuromuscular blockers, steroids, ECMO, inhaled uh, vasodilators. Uh, I learned at the uh, live version of this uh, conference that we do not have uh, nitric oxide available um, at the facility. I think we ought to. Uh, just want to throw that out there. Um, there are times when it makes an important difference. Case study one, we have three case studies for you. This is a 26-year-old male, five foot six inches, weighs uh, 56.8 kilograms, admitted for heroin overdose, and was intubated and placed on volume control ventilation. Chest x-ray, bilateral fluffy infiltrates. I'm pretty sure that should say fluffy. And then ventilatory data are as follows. Let's figure out what this uh, patient's tidal volume ought to be. Uh, it's 50 kilograms plus two times the inches over five feet plus two for being male. So that's going to be six times two is 12 plus 50 is 62. It's a male, so 64 uh, kilograms, ideal body weight. And now we're going to go times six, tidal volume uh, 384. Oh, my, this tidal volume is 600. So that's one thing that needs to be addressed. Uh, that is considerably too much tidal volume for this patient. We're on pure oxygen. Uh, 1.0 is 100% oxygen. Rate of 12, PIP of 5, uh, PIP is 55. So that is going to tell us we either need to fix that PIP or we have to go to pressure control ventilation. So we're going to consider pressure control ventilation here. Plateau pressure 48. We're shooting for 30. Another indication this patient probably belongs on pressure control ventilation. But we've got to fix this oxygenation issue. That's the pressing issue. Um, we've got a PaO2 of 44, 85% saturation, and we're on pure oxygen. We're on pure oxygen. So what do you recommend here? I'll give you just a minute to think this through, and then I'll give you my thoughts. Well, one thing we've got to do, and we've got to do it now, is raise the PEEP. Because pure oxygen, there's nowhere to go. You know, we can't go to 120% oxygen. So we have to go up on the PEEP. I would go to eight. I know some uh, therapists or uh, pulmonologists would go to 10 immediately. Can't argue with that. But I would go to eight and see what happens. I would also try quickly to bring the PIP down. And if not, then I would get over to pressure control ventilation and I would set that pressure at the current plateau, uh, 48. We may be able to bring that down. Case study two, 60 kilogram female patient, uh, maintained on mechanical ventilation seven days. Uh, patient's normal ABGs, or well, patient's normal baseline ABGs, that's important, 7.38 CO2 of 51. This is a CO2 retainer. PEO 258, bicarb 29. The high bicarb tells you that this patient has had a high CO2 for a prolonged period of time. ABGs on uh, volume control, uh, rate of 10. Tidal volume 600. That's a 60 kilogram patient. We don't have the height. FiO2 25%. Oh my, okay. And pH 7.41. PaCO2 is 40. Now, Notice that's a problem, folks, because this patient's normal CO2 is 51. We have ventilated them down to 40. O2 is 67, bicarb 24. The patient has no spontaneous respiratory effort. To wean the patient, the mode was changed to pressure support. After a short time, the spontaneous respiratory rate was 28, tidal volume 250, and the saturation drops from 95 to 91. The patient appears anxious. What's going on with this patient? Well, we have screwed up. We have overventilated this patient to a CO2 level far lower, far lower than the patient's normal CO2 level. Um, patient has been over hyperventilated, and the kidneys have reduced the bicarb level to normal. 
When the mode is changed to facilitate weaning, the patient's CO2 rises, stimulating spontaneous ventilation. It's been said you can't outsmart the kidneys, and I believe that wholeheartedly. So ventilate the patient. Here's the lesson from this case. Ventilate the patient to their normal CO2, not to our idea of the normal CO2. Air goes in and out. Blood goes round and round. You are not smarter than the kidneys, and you cannot fix stupid medicine in a nutshell. One more case. 55-year-old male. Uh, last year, his doctor told him he has COPD. Today in the ER, he describes two-day history of worsening dyspnea, which came on after a viral uh, URI. Saturation 88, room air. On exam, diffuse wheezes and prolonged expiratory phase. Chest x-ray is consistent with moderate COPD, but no focal infiltrates are seen. Hmm, interesting. pH 7.2, CO2 of 55. O2 is 64, bicarb 25. Well, that pH, well, let me give you a minute to think about it. <laughs> Sorry. That pH is 7.20. When I started in this profession, probably would have gotten the patient intubated. But today we know better. We can simply use non-invasive ventilation, commonly called BiPAP, and blow that CO2 down somewhat. We don't want to blow it down too much, but we can probably bring the pH up into a more acceptable range, and we can probably also better oxygenate the patient. Well, they're already at 64. That might actually be their normal. But we can improve ventilation and oxygenation with non-invasive ventilation, BiPAP, and not proceed to intubate this patient at this time, and maybe not have to. Conclusion, St. Mary's has a staff, a highly trained uh, state licensed, nationally credentialed respiratory therapist. A lot of them trained just down the street in my program, and I am very proud of them. I would say, gosh, probably 75% of the, uh, the staff is now uh, graduates from our program. Guidelines shared in this presentation will help you. You will receive a handbook titled Oaks Ventilator Management. It's a small handbook, fits in the lab coat, and uh, it is a valuable resource. I use it for things that I uh, don't do often enough and I need to look them up. Uh, so, and if you'd like additional training, any aspect of managing ventilators or really any respiratory care whatsoever, I would be happy to prepare that for you. And I know that uh, I'm speaking for my partner, uh, uh, Jim Grants, that he will, will help. So let us know how we can assist. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on mechanical ventilation.